When I was in middle school, uh, I got a four-wheeler. <laughs> you know where this is going. Uh, and, and what happened was my neighbor actually had a four-wheeler kind of like track in their backyard. And uh, me and, and my neighbor friend, uh, we became like brother and sister. So there's always this like friendly competition that was going on. And so uh, she had a four-wheeler and that kind of convinced my parents to get me one. And we would constantly after school go back behind her backyard and, and literally just race this track and run and have a ton of fun. And so this one day, again, we had been riding for a long time. We kind of take a break. In the midst of that, begin to trash talk one another. I can go faster than you. My four-wheeler's better than you. Well, let's put our money where our mouth is. So again, in the heat of competition, we both get on our four-wheeler. I don't have a helmet on. We begin to race one lap because, you know, we're tired, done, last, kind of last lap type thing. And we begin to race. And as we're going around the track, uh, I pull ahead. There's a kind of an area where you can kind of pull around and, and then it begins to narrow out. And so I pull around and get the lead. Uh, and in the spirit of competition, I turn around and begin to mock her. Ha ha, I'm winning. As I turn back around, before I know it, there's a tree that some, somehow magically popped up in the way. AKA, I got off the path. And because I had my eyes turned around, and when I turned around, before I could realize it, before I could fix it, I hit this tree, and the four-wheeler stops, but I do not. And I launch off the four-wheeler, forehead smacks into a tree. A long story short, I have to go to the hospital and get seven staples put in my head. Uh, and still today, I have a pretty gnarly scar. Um, you know, hey, chick stick scars. My wife, that's how I got her, all right? <laughs> and here's the reality of that situation. I got my eyes in the wrong direction. When I took my eyes off of the place I was supposed to go, the direction I needed to face, it led to no good. Here, here's the reality. Where you turn matters. Where you fixate, where your attention is matters. And it may not seem as catastrophic as hitting a tree and, and running off the road and smacking your head on the floor, but I promise you it's actually worse. Like if you get your attention off of Jesus long enough, it will only lead to calamity, destruction, and chaos. And yet the reality is this morning, Jesus is inviting us to look at him, to get our eyes in the right direction, to fixate on the right thing. If you walk away with nothing else this morning, walk away with this. God continues to call us to turn towards him, not anything else, turn towards him so that we get our eyes off of ourselves and onto our savior. This is why it's so, like, again, this is the heartbeat of Pentecost Sunday. This is the heartbeat of Holy Spirit. He's like, my goal is to get your eyes off of you, off of your stuff, off of your situation, off of the other things, and onto Jesus. And he's the only one who can get our eyes open and fixated on that reality. And that's what God wants us to see this morning. And he even wants us to see it in this book of Isaiah, in chapters 38 and 39. So let's dive in. 38 verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became sick and was at the point of death. That's bad news. Hezekiah is the king of Israel and, and he becomes sick to the point of death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, came to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die. You shall not recover. Again, horrible news, terrible situation. Then Hezekiah turned his face. If you're a highlighter, underliner, circler in your Bible, Underline, circle, highlight that phrase. Turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, Please, O Lord, remember how I have walked before you in faithfulness and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Here, here's what we have going on here. Hezekiah turns his attention back onto God and begins to pray to him. Again, we see Hezekiah and other kings of Israel have moments of weakness and moments of victory. This is a moment where we see Hezekiah gets it right. Where he begins to uh, turn his attention, fixate back on God, turn towards, away from the people, away from the chaos, away from the situation, and onto God. And he prays to him. Again, we've talked about the, the significance and importance and power of prayer. Again, it's not, the power of prayer isn't on our end, it's on his end. It's on the one whom we're praying to's end. It's on God's end. He asks God to remember how he had walked with him. He's like, hey God, remember that I, I've tried to walk with you. I've, I've been faithful. You can even kind of spot some potential pride and arrogance. That's actually Hezekiah's demise. His downfall is he's a little too arrogant. All right? And so even in his prayer, you see kind of that rear its head a little bit. And then he weeps bitterly. The scriptures don't uh, necessarily clarify why he's weeping bitterly. But, but one of the reasons that a lot of commentators believe is because at this point in his life, he has no one to carry on his lineage. He has no sons. So imagine having no sons and, and you get the news like, hey, you're going to die. And you need to get everything in order. Well, how, how do I do that? I have no one to take my, my stuff. I have no one to give my inheritance to. And so he begins to weep 
bitterly. We, we can understand that. We can resonate with that this morning. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. Go and say to Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. And let, th let that wash over some of you this morning. That God hears and sees. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. What a miracle. I will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria and will defend this city. So let's talk about those few verses for a minute. God refers to himself as the God of David, your father. He's reminding him, hey, I I'm the God of David. Remember who I am. I'm stepping up. I'm speaking out. I'm showing off to remind you that, man, I have a bigger plan in play. I have a bigger picture in mind here. He's, he's saying, hey, listen, I've been faithful. I'm the faithful God of David. I'll be faithful again today. Again, God, his intent often in our situations is to get our eyes up. You and I have a tendency to look down. And God's saying, let, let me remind you of my epicness, remind you of my track record, remind you of how big and awesome I am. I'm the God of David. And so that's what he's doing here, getting our eyes up. He then begins to say that he hears and sees Hezekiah. Like, like that's in, important to highlight here, that he sees and hears Hezekiah, that God is listening when he prays. And he then promises to add more years to his life. And he promises to deliver him and his city out of the hands of Assyria, which again, we know based on last week's story that God actually does this in the snap of a finger. If you weren't here last week, we see earlier on, this is again, the, bo the book of Isaiah hops, skips, and jumps all over the place. So it's not linear. So again, this is actually referring to things that we've already talked about, which we talked about last week, where literally Hezekiah cries out to the Lord. God says, all right, here you go. Watch me work. Snaps his finger. 180,000 people drop dead one night. And they wake up in the morning and it's chaos and calamity. The king of Assyria goes back home and gets killed by his own two sons while he's in the house of worship of a false god. I love how God rolls. It's pretty awesome. And so again, he's promising to deliver him and to promise to deliver his city out of the hands of Assyria and he promises to defend them. God is our defender. This gives us insight that this part of the story is actually happening again prior to what we talked about last week. Verse 7. This shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will be this thing or will do this thing that he has promised. Again, God's word is enough. If God said it, we need to believe it because he will do it. May not be how you like it, may not be in your timeline, but he's still going to do it. And yet God is so gracious and kind to even at times give us signs. He's not obligated to. Get that clear. Like, he's not obligated to give signs, but delights to so he can, again, assure us. And so he's saying here, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going to give you a sign to show you how faithful I am. Behold, I will make the shadow cast by the declining sun on the dial of Ahaz turn back ten steps. Again, what he's saying is, I'm going to turn back time to show you how good I am. Isn't that awesome that we serve a God who's like, let me, let me just do the impossible real quick to show you how awesome I am. Let me, let me just turn the clock back 10 minutes. And again, I, I don't know about you, but I've been in situations that's kind of like a little side moment for free. I, like when you pray to God for him to redeem time, he's more than capable of doing it. And just, so again, God can do this. It's not new for him. So look what happens. The sun turned back on the dial, the 10 steps by which he had, it had declined. So what we see, God gives him a sign that he'll turn the sundial backwards. Again, God can do the impossible. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you have a situation in your life, or, or maybe even just your whole life, where it seems like this is just an impossible endeavor that I don't know how I'm gonna overcome. Sure, you, you don't know how you're gonna overcome it, but God is more than capable and already has a game plan in play of how he's going to do so. He's more than capable of miracles. He's got a PhD in miracles. That's, that's how he operates in roles. He invented them, mastered them, and is longing to put them on display to the glory of his name. And the sun turned back on the dial. So we see again, this promise is fulfilled. The first thing I want us to talk about this morning is this. Turning towards God is the pathway to mercy. Turning towards God is the pathway to mercy. So if God is calling us to turn to him, we're going to talk about like why that's important and how that begins to work. So the first thing is that it's a pathway to mercy. Here's a question I want to ask you this morning. When you are faced with life, where do you turn? When you're faced with chaos or turmoil or heartache or fear or the unknown or things that seem scary to you, whatever it may be, like where do you turn? You need to answer that question this morning because that's going to determine to you who is your God. 
or what is your God? Where you turn in times of chaos, anxiety, fear, leisure, times of celebration, when things are coasting and going well, and when things feel like you're drowning in underwater, that is your functional savior. That is your functional God. It may be an idol. It, it actually may be the Lord. But if it's not the Lord, it is an idol. Where do you turn? And again, whatever that is for you, if it's not Jesus, I just want to invite you today to let that burn up, to, to like cast it into the holy fire and let Jesus consume it and replace it with something better, a.k.a. himself. That, that's what he wants to do, but he's inviting us to turn to him. Hezekiah gets it right. He turns his back on the world and turns his face towards God in prayer. And I just encourage you this morning to turn to him. Don't get fixated on the situation, but look towards the face of God. Again, I don't know what you're all going through. I know what some of us are going through, right? And I know some of it seems big and massive, gargantuan, overwhelming for us. Again, it's no match for King Jesus. Would you turn towards him and let him handle it in your life? God's position, again, when Hezekiah turns, what does God do? I see you. I hear you. Let me answer your prayer. Some of us are fearful to turn towards God because we're afraid of his response. And God is here to say that I'm positioned to show you mercy and grace. When you turn towards him, his position to lavish upon you is not condemnation. It's not guilt. It's not shame. It's not condescending. It's love, grace, and mercy. Again, God could have responded differently, but he chooses not to. He chooses to be himself and to give what only he's capable of giving, which is true grace, mercy, and love. And that's what he is offering to you and me today. He reminds us, he comforts us today in saying, hey, listen, I hear you. I hear you. Like, like the prayers in your private prayer closet, whatever that looks like for you, the prayers that, that aren't even articulate, the prayers that don't have words because you, you can't kind of muster up the words, the prayers that are just soaking, uh, tears just dripping down your face and soaking up the things around you, like those prayers he hears. The groanings of your heart he hears. The situations where you feel like, man, you're trying and it's just not working, or you feel like you're in over your head, or you're exhausted, or you feel cynical. You, you feel like, man, I, I have some faith, but, but what I have, I don't really even know how to put into words. He sees you. That's his mercy and his grace reaching out to say, listen, I am here, I am close, I am near. Will you turn towards me? Would you rest in that promise this morning that he hears us and he sees us? This is giving us confidence to go to him. When we pray, he hears. When we pray, he sees. And he is on the balls of his feet waiting to respond. And he will defend us. He will pour out love on you. He will defend you because of his namesake, first and foremost. Like he, he wants to give you grace and mercy so he can make his name known. And so again, he's committed to doing that. So here's the million dollar question this morning. Will you turn your face to the Lord today? Will you turn your face to the Lord today? Will you watch him respond to you with mercy and grace? That's what he wants to give you today. He has a lot of it. He's storing it up and he wants to pour it out in abundance upon you. Grace and mercy. Will you turn to him? That's who he is and what he does. It's not just that God has grace and mercy. He is grace and mercy. So the way in which God gives you grace and mercy is more of himself, more proximity, closer attention and intimacy with him. What seems like an impossibility for you is easy for the Lord. Will you turn towards him? Will you allow him to begin to open up that pathway of grace and mercy for you? Lean on him to do it today. Watch him. Like, I would just, again, I would encourage you, like, take him at his word. Hey, God, you tell me. If I turn to you, you're going to give me grace and mercy. All right, do it. He will answer that prayer. He is good on his word. Take it to the bank and actually cash it. I encourage you to do so today. Verse 9, writing, a writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. So now we get an insight into the mind and heart of Hezekiah. We see again, the situation plays out. God shows up, shows off, is faithful, heals and does a miracle. And then we see some insight again from our brother Hezekiah. This is what's going on in his head and his heart, which is very important for us to see because it helps us see that like he's human. 
We can often read characters in the Bible as if they're some superheroes on a pedestal. They're just like you and me. And so I hope, again, this is relatable to us and we can learn some lessons from it. Verse 10, I said, in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. I said, I shall not see the Lord, the Lord in the land of the living. I shall look on man no more among the inhabitants of the world. Hezekiah, at this point, when this death sentence essentially is given to him, he is 39 years old. 39. Like as a 30-year-old, I'm like, dang, that's, an, that's sobering. Like you think of all the ambitions and dreams this guy must have had. Again, a longing for someone to take his throne. Could you imagine what it must have been like to, to get this news from the, the prophet of Isaiah and say, okay, well, I, get your house in order because it's coming. So again, we see right here, Hezekiah pour out his heart to the Lord and we get an insight to that. We see that he saying that I'm consigned to the gates of Sheol. Sheol is the grave. It's the place of the dead. That's what we see in the Old Testament. That word is used. That's what it's referring to. Hezekiah here is lamenting and mourning the fact that his life is coming to an end. Again, makes sense. It's understandable. I want to encourage you that like lamenting and mourning is okay. But it's not where we stay. And we'll get there in a moment. Verse 12, my dwelling is plucked up and removed from me like a shepherd's tent. Like a weaver, I have rolled up my life. He cuts me off from the loom. From day to night, you bring me to an end. I calm myself under, until the morning, and like a lion, he breaks all my bones. From day to night, you bring me to an end. Like a swallow or a crane, I chirp. I moan like a dove. My eyes are weary with looking upward. Can you say that? Can, can we say that, right? That, God, I'm, I'm like so tired because I can't stop looking up. Like, I hope that's like the cry of our hearts. That like, I'm, I'm getting weary from looking upward. My neck's starting to hurt because I'm looking upward. Again, there's a little bit of arrogance and pride in this and some self-pity, but I want us to see that like he's giving his attention to the right direction. And God's going to correct and change some stuff here in a minute. Oh, Lord, I am oppressed. Be my pledge of safety. So, so what is Hezekiah doing here in the first kind of section of his prayer? He's highlighting our temporal life and how temporal it really is. He's saying, hey, listen, like I had all these dreams and ambitions and they're all coming to a close. Like I, I'm not going to be with people anymore. Like, like the grave is calling my name. Death is sure. And so he's, he's just lamenting in the fact that his life is coming to an end. Again, like the Lord tells us to teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. But if you get kind of that death sentence, if you're like, hey, it's coming and it's coming quickly, there's a moment, a sobering reality of lament. And so that's what Hezekiah is doing here. And he's saying, man, my life is like a shepherd's tent. He uses kind of two analogies here. It's a, there's a shepherd's tent and a weaver cutting cloth or yarn. And he's saying, listen, like the shepherd's tent is not permanent. It's temporal. It moves with the herd. So it's constantly taken up and put back down and taken back up and put back down again. So my life is like that. It feels like, man, I'm just being uprooted. Just when I had some momentum, some things going, boom, it's pulled up. And it's like a weaver cutting cloth. It's rolled up and, man, just, I feel like, again, I was a part of the tapestry and I'm cut off. That's the uh, kind of illustrations we see Hezekiah using. He's whining and moaning like a bird. And so, again, if you're hanging out with Hezekiah, it's like, man, is that a swallow or is that a dove? Oh, no, that's our boy Hezekiah. He's just weeping and crying and moaning. That's kind of what's, what's happening here. He's like someone who's been mauled by a lion. Did you catch that part? It's like, man, it, like, it's like God seems like he, he attacked me like a lion. Again, he's pouring his heart out to the Lord. He says he's tired, weary, and oppressed. So again, he's, he's lamenting and mourning. And, and I just, again, I want to encourage you, that's okay, but he does not stay there. And some of us need to hear that this morning. Like We need to move on from the lament and mourning because we have the gospel. We'll get there. And he begs God to save him. That, that's the beauty here. He's able to pour that all out. He's able to get vulnerable, honest, and real before the Lord because then he, he clings to the Lord for salvation. Save me. Like, like I love how it says, be my pledge of safety. Second thing this morning, turning towards God proclaims our need for him. Turning towards God proclaims our need for him. See, Hezekiah gets it right in this way. When he turns toward God, he's acknowledging his dependence. When we turn towards the Lord, even if it's messy and, and it's kind of awkward and weird, and, and maybe we don't even want other people to see into it, it's proclaiming that we need him. 
It's proclaiming that we are dependent on him. And let me just tell you this morning, dependence is freedom. Don't buy the lies of this world that says, you do you, you go get yours at any means possible. That's bondage. That's slavery. That's the language of the devil. That's why the devil is actually in the situation he's in because he bought that lie too. That listen, you go do it your way. I know better than God and I'm going to have it my way. And that's actually why he is in opposition towards our God. When you go to the Lord in dependence, that's actually declaring your, the, the way in which you're made. It's actually a way in which you can walk in freedom. And I'm, I just want to encourage you this morning. You were made to be dependent. You were made for it. It's the longing of your soul. When he fearfully and wonderfully made you in your mother's womb, a part of that making was dependence on him. And that's how you experience freedom and liberty and life to the full and joy beyond your wildest dreams is being attached and dependent to the Lord. It's when you become attached and dependent to yourself or other things that causes all kinds of just mess and chaos. It's when you try to be independent that actually the world begins to fall around you. Will you turn back towards him? Will you walk in dependence? You see, Hezekiah is getting real and honest with God and so can you. Like you can get honest and real with God. Let me have a caveat here. Be careful who you're talking to. Again, Job lets God have it, and then God lets Job have it. But, let, you know, again, God gets put up on the chopping block, so to speak, and Job's like, what are you doing, God? And he begins to, and then, again, God lets him do that for a moment, and then he's like, all right, let's, let's turn this thing around. And then God puts Job on the chopping, chopping block, doesn't answer any of his questions, just actually begins to question him. Hey, where were you at when I made all the things? Did you loosen Orion's belt? No, I do that. Like all those stars in the sky, do you even know where they're at? No, I do, and I know their names. Like I know all the animals. I know every hair on the back of your head. Who are you talking to, bro? <laughs> so again, be honest, be real. Go to God. I say it this way. He's a big boy. He can handle it. And yet, he will handle it. <laughs> and part of handling it may be knocking you down a peg or ten. And giving you a dose of humility that you so lovingly need. So again, be careful and respectful because our God is holy. He's like no other. When Isaiah gets that image and vision of God in the throne room, he's not just chilling, you know, kind of with his boys on the throne saying, hey, bro, come and check it out. No, he's, he's actually puts fe- the fear of God into Isaiah because the, the angels that freak Isaiah out are the ones freaked out because of the presence of the Lord. And Isaiah's response is, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, dwelling amongst the people of unclean lips. So again, come to him honest, real, vulnerable, but respectful. Express your need. Like express your need to God. Again, he already knows it. He already knows it. It's not like when you say it, he's like, oh, true, my bad, I forgot that one. No, he knows it. But as you express your need, it's, it's showing your dependence on him. It's showing that you care and that you're actually going to trust him at his word. And so here's the thing. Express your need and then trust his promise. Some of us are really good at expressing our need and then we're hesitant to trust his promise. You have no right to express your need if you're not going to trust his promise. But I promise you, trusting his promise will lead to life, liberty, and freedom like you wouldn't believe. So come to him, express your need, and then take a hold of his promise. Lamenting and mourning again is needed and it's a part of the process, yet God is not calling you to stay there. And I think for some of us this morning, we are comfortable in the lament and mourning because we're afraid of what's going to happen when God actually shows up. The comfort of mourning and lament can be easy to sit and wallow in, and yet the discomfort of actually letting God handle the situation may uproot some of the things in your life that are unhealthy and you just don't want it. I'm here to tell you this morning, like, man, man, some of us, again, we're comfortable and just like, kind of being mopey before the Lord because we know that if God, if we actually surrender it to him, he's going to handle it and he's going to flip our world upside down. I know it's scary. I know it's hard. I know that actually requires you to let go of some things. But I promise you, you're in good hands. We talked about it last week. Better than all state, the Lord's hands are good. They're faithful. Will you trust them? So get honest and then get your eyes up and get ready for God to move. Like, hear those. Like, again, I try to alliterate to help you out, okay? Get honest. Get your eyes up. So, again, God, here, here's where I'm at. And I'm going to get my eyes up on you. And then get ready for God to respond. 
Like, it's not acceptable for us as Christians to just say, well, okay, God, I'm, I'm here and this is just where I'm at. Like, that's one third of this process. Well, it's, just, it's just a lot in life. No. Go to the Lord, get your eyes up, and then get ready for him to move. Ready for him to show up. Ready for him to bless you. Ready for him to, to redeem you and save you. Ready for him to blow your expectations out of the water. I promise you cannot out-expect God. Put the highest expectation on him and he will outdo you, I promise you. Get your eyes up and get ready for him to respond. Listen, the next verse here. What shall I say? Hezekiah is speechless. What shall I say? For he has spoken to me and he himself has done it. He's talking about God. So now I walk slowly all my years because of the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live and in all these is the life of my spirit. Oh, restore me to health and make me live. Hezekiah begins to shift again from lament and mourning to praise and adoration. Because what, what shall I say? I'm praising God and I'm, I'm speechless. I, I don't even have words because he's that good. He's that faithful. He's shown up and shown up that much. He praises God because he said it would happen and he did it. He has spoken to me and he himself has done it. I, I even got words for it. Have you ever been in a situation like that where God moves in such a powerful way that you try to articulate it to somebody who wasn't there? You're like, bro, you just needed to be there. Like, sis, you should have just been there. I, I, I can't even, I'm not even doing it justice. That's the moment Hezekiah has here. He says, I'm going to walk slowly, which means he's going to be humble and walk carefully with God. He's saying, even because of the bitterness of my soul, because of what I experienced, because of what I've went through, because of that hardship, it's going to teach me to walk humble. It's going to teach me to walk slow. Some of you have some things in your life that God is not getting rid of quite yet because he's wanting to teach you a lesson. What it looks like to be walking slowly, humble and dependent on him. Trust the process. He's asking God to restore and make him live. He's asking God to restore him and make him live. This is, again, a shift in the conversation, a shift in the perspective for Hezekiah. Verse 17, behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. It's not a memory verse, but it should be. Behold, it was for my welfare that I had great bitterness. But in love, you have delivered my life from the pit of destruction. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. For she hold does not thank you. Death does not praise you. Those who go down to the pit do not hope for your faithfulness. The living, the living, he thanks you. As I do this day, the father makes known to the children your faithfulness. Hezekiah gets proper perspective. He gets proper perspective. He says, hey, it's for my own good that I went through this. Again, that's, that's what, again, when, when we are able to get outside of the situation and look back on it and see, and God's hand was all in it, and if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. I can say that about all the, like you want to look at the, like the top five like hardest seasons of my life, all of them I'm thankful for. Why? Because it's taught me perspective. Like it was for my own good and benefit that I went through that heartache. He proclaims God's love. He said it delivered him and it dealt with his sin. So again, the perspective goes from woe is me to look at how awesome he is. Wow, look at my God. And he thanks God. He's like, the father makes known to the children your faithfulness. Surely we've seen God's faithfulness here. Next point, turning towards God leads to purpose. Turning towards God leads to purpose. One of the, the biggest questions we ask in life, especially a, a lot of young folks, and I say that relatively because we're all young in the Lord, amen? Yes. What is my purpose? What is my purpose? I, I want to kind of debunk some of the lies that are in our culture, especially in the Christian culture, that there's like this secret jewel somewhere out there for you to find and to labor and exhaust yourself to find and that you're not loved or good enough until you find it. It's, it's a load of crap. I love you enough to tell you. We all have the same purpose. All of us. Here it is. If you take notes, your purpose is this. It's very simple. To know God, make him known. Know God, make him known. Know God, make him known. Like I, I encourage you to tattoo it on yourself. Like, like make it your screensaver. Like send it, tweet it today. Whatever you need to do. Like that is your purpose. But what about this, that, and the other? No. To know him and make him known. Now, there's a lot of creativity in the how. A lot of creativity in the how. This is where Holy Spirit begins to get into that thing and begins to, hey, but I've wired you this way. And I, I've given you these passions and I've given you these gifts and I've given you this life experience. So again, how you do this, there's a lot of creativity. There are some limits. You can't just do this any way you want to. 
but there's a lot of freedom and creativity in Holy Spirit to the how of how we know God and make him known. But we have to turn to God to keep us humble in this process and in this purpose. It starts with humility. It's, it's coming before the Lord and being dependent on him. Saying, God, I need you in this. I need you to show me. I need you to help me understand how to do this. And, and part of the humility is realizing that God has no intent of you doing things for him. He only wants to do things with you. Some of y'all didn't catch that. I'll say it again. God has no intent of you doing things for him. He wants you to do things with him. Religion says, do this for me. Relationship says, do this with me. God is inviting us into a relationship with him. That's what Christianity is. Hey, join my kingdom, join my party, join my celebration. I'm doing this, been doing it for a hot minute. Come hop on the team. That, that's what Jesus is doing with you and me. That's what he does with, this, with the disciples. That's what happens on Pentecost Sunday. Again, it's the birth of the church. It's not the birth of the kingdom. The kingdom's already happening. The church is just now the next movement of the kingdom. Hey, come, come join me on my adventure of a lifetime. And so that's what he's offering for us to do, but it requires us to see that perspective change. And again, this is liberty and freedom for you today. God isn't wanting you to do things like on mission apart from him. It'd be miserable one, and it would be mean of him to try to do that because you're not good enough to do it on your own. You need him. But with him, you're more than capable. You're a conqueror and a co-heir. You're a son or a daughter of the most high God. You are alive and well, and the kingdom is advancing forward through you. If you do it with him, not for him. Amen. And then turning towards him reminds us that we have been delivered from the pit. Let's look, look at what Hezekiah says. In love, you've delivered me from the pit of destruction. Isn't that true of you and me today? You and I have been delivered from the pit of destruction. Again, apart from Jesus, like we were headed to hell with a full tank of gas, which is costly in today's culture, right? You've driven past rudders lately? My Lord. But we were heading to hell and we had no, nothing stopping us. And yet Jesus met us saved us and delivered us from the pit by his grace. Turning reminds us that our sin is behind us. Listen to what Hezekiah says. Man, I feel like this is for everybody in the room, not just some of us, everybody. You have cast all my sins behind your back. God is saying, you put them behind you. So God is not dwelling on your sin. Why are you? I will. God isn't dwelling on your sin. Why are you? You know, say that to you in love to, to get you out from underneath that, that bondage and burden that, that's actually pseudo. It's not even really there because God isn't putting it on you. You're putting it on yourself. We see that he gets the proper perspective and that should give us proper perspective today. Your sin is behind you, which means you can stand firm in your identity in Christ. You are not a sinner. You're a saint. A dearly loved saint, a child of the most high God. That is your primary identity. And if you're in here and you don't know Jesus, then you are a sinner. But the good news is Jesus came for you. He came for sinners to move you from a sinner to a saint, to move you from a sinner to a son or a daughter of the most high God. Would you accept the invitation of his salvation today? That's the offer on the table for you and for me. So how do we walk in our purpose? Again, we know it's to know God and to make him known. How do we do that? Again, we can overcomplicate this so quickly and yet God has no intent for that for you. So here's how we do it. We praise God with our lips and our lives wherever we're at today. We praise him with our lips and with our lives wherever we're at today. So again, don't, don't get so fixated on, on where you've been or where you're going, where you're at today. Where does God have you? What are your relationships? What are you doing after this? Wait, are you going to go out to eat? Are you going to go to the pool? Are you going to go hang out with family? Like, are you going to get ready for your work, like work week? What are you, you going to do? And, and serve and praise God in the midst of doing it. Again, God's not telling you exhaust yourself, sell everything and move across the world. Like maybe for some of us, but not for all of us. He's saying, hey, where I've got you, where I've planted you, make an impact. Praise me and point to me in everything you say and do. Give thanks to the Lord in all things. So if you go out to eat, tip that waitress good. Tip that waiter good. Eat good food. Thank that person. Celebrate, pray, praise the Lord in public for what he's done. And be a good like citizen. Open doors, smile for people. Like, tell them why you're so happy. Proclaim the good news of Jesus as you go. This is how we make an impact in the world. We talk about this being a part of our mission here at Zeal Church. How do we make an impact in the world? We, we praise God with our lips and lives wherever we go. 
and we start today. We don't, we don't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. We don't take a day off from praising God. We don't do it once a week on Sundays. We do it all the time, every day, in everything. We show the world what new life in Jesus really looks like in everything. Really everything? Yes, everything. Let me help you see this. So in your relationships, in your family dynamics, in your marriage, in your parenting, with your money, with your work, whether that's paid work or volunteer work, you work with excellence because you're working for God, not men. In your education, as you're learning and studying and desiring to know things, in your education, in sex, in eating and drinking, in discipline, in serving, in leadership, the world is dying and desperate for good leadership. And good leadership does not mean how can I get to the top and how many backs can I stab or how many steps up the ladder can I go? No, it's how can I get on the, the ground on my knees and get dirty like King Jesus. We're dying and desperate for good leadership, especially in the church. We need it. It's a way to serve God and to point people to him. Entrepreneurship. And as you're creative and you're wired to start things and to spin things off and your mind just can't stop turning at night, use that for the glory of God. Business owning. And we get a lot of business owners in this place who are taking over the world for King Jesus. Make him known in the process. Like I, I love how some people say we need less Christian blanks. We need more blanks that are Christians. Right? So, so we, don't, we don't need to put this like spin or sprinkle of Christian on things. We need to, to work hard and work well for the glory of God. There's a story Martin Luther talks about where what happens is this guy who's a shoemaker comes to Christ, has this radical 180 transformation. And the guy comes to Martin Luther, he's like, I just need to quit everything and be a pastor. And he goes, no, you don't. Make good shoes for the glory of God. Don't have to put little crosses on them or little fishes on them. Just make an excellent quality product that people are going to want and desire and tell people why you're doing it. That's what it means to be a blank that's a Christian. Whether you're a business owner, you're a parent, whether you work for a company, whether you're starting one, whether you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever you're doing, do it with excellence for the glory of God in your teaching, in your celebration. Man, Christians should be party starters and we should never stop. We should be good at leisure. You should be restful. You should not be anxious and burnt out all the time. Christians should be excellent at rest and leisure. Again, we should party like nobody's business. We should sing. Even if it's off key and we can't carry a tune in a bucket, we should be having reasons to sing. And let's start here today, amen? In our exercise, in our communication, in everything, giving your life to the kingdom of the living God. It's all his. There's nothing that he can't touch. If you've surrendered your life to him, you've surrendered everything to him. He doesn't have some of it. He has all of it. Let him take control. Your purpose is clear today, church family. Walk in it confidently because Holy Spirit in you is willing and able to use your life to make much of Jesus. Verse 20, again, I told you, singing's coming. The Lord will save me and will play, we will play my music on stringed instruments all the days of our lives at the house of the Lord. Now Isaiah had said, let them take a cake of figs and apply it to the boil that he may recover. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? See, Hezekiah here declares that, that God would save him. Again, he's saying, God will do it. Not he might, not he can, he will. That's faith, that's confidence, that's trust in the Lord. He will save me. He makes clear the logical response. Hey, he, he will save me, so I'm going to praise him. He's going to save me. The only logical response to that is praising him. We see then God heals him through a fig cake. I want to highlight this. This one's for free. God used a medical treatment here. He, he promised to deliver Hezekiah. He does it through a natural means of healing. Hey, put that fig cake on there and heal him. So again, this is just for free. Like God can use modern medicine. God can use things like, again, don't chalk up like faith in God to not trusting in the means of common grace that he's given to his people because he does it here. It's good news. So I'm so thankful for you medical professionals in this place that you're meeting people in that place and that you're having faith in God, not in the, the medical system, but you're using that to, again, bring glory to God. It's beautiful. Keep it up. He is asking for a sign, which we see was given to him in seven uh, verses seven and eight when the sun moved back on the dial. We see that like, when is this, or what is the sign that I shall go up to in the house of the Lord? He already did it. I turned time back. Now you can go. The fourth thing this morning is this. Turn towards God. Turning towards God produces joy. It produces joy. Joy is the natural byproduct of turning towards Jesus. If you're miserable, 
You haven't turned towards him. Or maybe you've turned towards him. Again, I think maybe this is some of us in the room. Okay, Jesus, I'm going to turn towards you, but I'm still going to stare at myself. I'm still going to stare at my misery, stare at my, my problems. But I turn towards Jesus. Look at him. Get your eyes up on him. Maybe if you feel like you don't have the strength to have a brother or sister, tilt your head up. Maybe beg God, get my eyes on you, Jesus. Because turning towards him and staring at yourself is not a good solution to your problems. It's turning towards him and getting your eyes up on him. Joy is found in the person of Jesus, not your situations, not your circumstances, and not your issues. The changing of circumstances doesn't produce joy. His presence does. This is why all throughout human history, you see people, their circumstances may even get worse, and yet their joy increases because their joy is not found in stuff or situations. It's found in Jesus. Look at Stephen. Acts 7, Pentecost happens, fast forward a few chapters. We see Stephen, actually, we see the joy of the Lord exude from him as he's dying. Stones being thrown at him. He's praying for forgiveness. And then he goes to be with God. That's a terrible circumstance. That got worse, not better. God's not guaranteeing your circumstances will change. He's guaranteeing you joy will rise. Will you trust him? Joy is found in him alone. And joy springs up and out. And so when you have it, it's got to get out. Like joy is contagious. It, it calls to go out and up towards other people. How is God calling for the joy in you to come out of you today? And maybe right now he's, he's stirring it up, but he wants it to come out and go on to other people. And I'm here to tell you today, Zeal Church, joy is yours to have. Like if you're here today and you don't have it and you're longing for it, it's yours today. It's yours today. It's yours today. Don't leave this place without experiencing the joy of the Lord. And even if you don't feel it today, God is offering it to you. Even if you don't know how to get it, he's offering it to you. God, I, Alex, I, I don't really know how I can have joy, brother. I don't, I don't know how to have joy in this season. I don't know how to have joy in this circumstance. You have reason for joy always. What is it? The gospel. The gospel. The gospel of Jesus. Let me unpack a few. That the God of the universe made you in his image, made to be in relationship with you, spun the stars into creation and said, the crescendo of my making is humanity. And he made for us to be in relationship with him. And then we screwed it up. We turned our backs on him and turned towards self and turned towards sin. And that caused a fracture between us and him. The consequences of sin is death. And yet God did not sit on the sidelines. He hopped down out of heaven into creation, put on skin, became a human. And he lived a life of perfection, turning the world upside down, making water into wine, taking that water and then walking up on it. And then he, he healed people. He gave sight to the blind. He gave liberty to the captives. He told demons to shut their mouths and get out of there. He told storms to be quiet because he shows up on the scene. And all the while, those things were pointing to something bigger, which is the kingdom of God, calling people to repent and turn towards him. And that was all a setup that he would come and that he would die a sufficient death. He lived a life for you and he died a death in your place as you. And all of your sin and all of your shame and all of your guilt and all the weight was on him. And he gladly went to the cross, not as a victim, but as a volunteer for you. We tend to stop there with the gospel, but that's not good news. The good news is that payment actually worked. Because three days later, he hopped up out of the grave, he resurrected, and he stomped on the devil as he was getting his way up out of the grave. And then he appeared and revealed himself to people and said, listen, here I am, I told you. Look at my nail-pierced hands. But now wait a minute, I gotta go be with my father and I'm gonna send Holy Spirit. The good news is that Jesus not only resurrected, he ascended and he sent Holy Spirit. And now he lives in those who put their faith and trust in Jesus. And so, man, we are a force for good against the kingdom of darkness in this world because God lives in us. He's given us life and life to the full. That is reason for joy, period. Doesn't matter what you got going on, that surpasses it all. You have reason for joy today. So joy is yours, Zeal Church. Take a hold of it, embrace it, and stand in it. All right, we're going to wrap up. 39, verse 1. At that time, the son of Baldwin, I'm not going to try to pronounce that name, king of Babylon, sent envoys with letters and a present to Hezekiah. For he had heard that he had been sick and had recovered. And Hezekiah welcomed them gladly. Again, the situation's turned. We see Hezekiah has been healed. And now we see that the king of Babylon is reaching out. Hezekiah welcomed them gladly. And he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious oil, his whole armory. All that was found in his storehouses. 
There was nothing in his house or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. So again, the Babylonian king hears about Hezekiah, sends a sort of a peace offering. We kind of learned that this was kind of a double-minded tactic. He's trying to weasel his way into the kingdom to figure out what they got going on. But it seems at first just this peace offering. Hey, I heard you were sick, brother. Like, here, here's a, a letter and a gift. Like, how you doing? Let me check in on you. And so Hezekiah's like, yeah, come on, welcome to men, and begin to show the Babylonians all the riches of the kingdom. So, so what is Hezekiah doing here? Well, he's getting his eyes off of God and onto man. And in this, he's exposing his pride, arrogance, man-pleasing, and his frank foolishness. That's what Hezekiah is doing here. Then Isaiah sees it and addresses it. Verse 3, Then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come to you? Hezekiah said, They have come to me from a far country, from Babylon. He said, What have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, They have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when, you, when all that is in your house and that which your fathers have stored up to this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And some of your own sons who will come from you, whom you're, you will father. Again, here we see God promising through Isaiah, hey, you're going to have some sons. Again, this would have been like amazing news, but listen to what he says. They shall be taken away and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. For he thought there will be peace and security in my days. If you're confused by verse 8, it makes sense why you're confused. We'll get to that in a moment. Isaiah addresses Hezekiah. He asks, who were these people and what do they want? What were they up to? Well, Hezekiah responds and says, listen, they're from Babylon and I showed them everything. And Isaiah said, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. You made a, a grave mistake, my friend. He said, there's a time coming. As Isaiah begins to prophesy, hey, there's a time coming where they're going to take everything you have and they're going to carry it off to Babylon, including your sons. And they will serve as eunuchs in the kingdom of Babylon. And Hezekiah's response is, at least it's not me. At least it's not right now. At least it's in the future and not in the present. And so again, he has this kind of self-sufficient, self-gazing perspective that says, well, the word of the Lord's good because that's going to happen then. I'm, I'm good right now. I'm, you know, he's only promised me 15 years. So we'll be out of my lifetime. That's why Hezekiah responds. There will be peace and security in my days. It's not going to happen then. Do you see the folly? Do you see the selfishness, the pride, the sinful perspective Hezekiah has? It leads to the fifth and final point this morning. Turning towards God is a journey, not an event. It's a journey, not an event. One of the the biggest lies in American Christianity is that salvation and repentance is an event, not a process. God has saved you to keep saving you. You can have security and hope and solidity or like sureness in your salvation. And yet it's a continual process. No need for doubt or fear. Like if he's got you, he's got you. Who can pluck us out of his hand? Nothing. Not even you. Aha! Good news. Because if you could, you'd figure out a way you can't because he's got you and yet it's a process we have to submit to that Hezekiah got his eyes off of God and was consumed with pride and selfishness here's the truth church we're prone to wonder we're prone to wonder we're prone to get our eyes off of God and here's even better news yet you don't have to wonder like like I think we hear that like we're prone to wonder so it's just inevitable so let me just embrace the inevitable no Holy Spirit says hey listen yeah you might be prone but you don't have to anymore you don't have to so, so, so choose life. Don't choose death. You can choose life now. Choose it. You don't have to wonder anymore. God has made it possible for your eyes to not only get on Jesus, but stay fixated there. So it's not just this miserable like ebb and pl- flow of life. It's actual a journey, a progression in the right direction. Not like two steps forward and one step back, or even two steps forward and one step back. No, it's, it's better. It's progress in the right way. Like that's what God has for you. This is Holy Spirit's primary job to get your eyes upon Jesus and to keep them fixated there. When you're prone to wonder, that, like we think of that hymn, take my heart, Lord, take and seal it for thy courts above. Like seal it, because you can and you have and keep on doing it. So don't fool yourself into thinking that it's just a one-time thing. It's a daily, moment by moment, positioning of our minds and hearts on God. This is why we need the gospel. This is why this church will always preach the gospel. All the time, in everything we do. We will make the gospel of Jesus Christ known because it not only saves those who need saving, it saves those of us who have been saved. 
It's what keeps making us more like Jesus. It's what keeps overwhelming us. And I don't know about you, but the older I get and the more I hear the gospel, the more excited I get about it. The deeper it gets. I'm like, man, you, you really did that? Like for me? Oh, it's got that implication in my life that I, didn't, I wasn't aware of till now? So again, that's why we need the gospel. That's why we'll stay there always. We will never graduate from it. So if you have an expectation to come here and, and man, okay, we're new and young and we're only a year and a half old and so we're learning to walk and maybe one day we'll start running and, and, and we'll, you know, we'll move on to better things other than the gospel, this is not your church. Because we're not leaving the gospel. Like we're not leaving it. We're staying in it. We're resting in it. We're being sanctified in it. We're actually running in it. We're actually going to take over the world in it. Amen? It's the gospel that saves nothing else. We rest in our new identity in Jesus. And so we just gaze upon the beauty of him and, and the beauty of his gospel and we see nuances to it that we've never seen before. Not because the gospel changes, but because your perspective does. It's because your vision changes and you can see what's already been there in maybe a new and fresh way. I'm praying that happens for you today. So here's good news. Did you come in here today and have you wandered? Have you wandered away? Has your view gotten off of Jesus? You can turn back right now. You don't have to wait. There's not like a special moment in the service where it has to happen. It can happen literally right in this moment. You can get your eyes back on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Fixate on him. Stare at him. Not, not like get all caught up in what you did last week. No, get caught up in who he is right now. That's what you can do. You can turn towards him. And if you're wondering what is he going to do when I turn towards him, he's going to welcome you in gladly because he delights in repentance. He delights in it. He gets pleased in it. Again, the prodigal son is one of the best examples we have. The son turns around, has a game plan, goes back home. The father's like, shh, let me get you a calf. Let me get you a robe. Let me get you a ring. Let me lavish you with grace and mercy. If you're here today and you have wandered, here is your hope. Jesus is still beautiful right now. Like right now. Right, right now. Look at him. Look at Jesus. Not yourself, not your situation. Not the future, not even your past. Look, look at him and him alone. Stay fixated on him. Get your eyes on his beauty. Where are you looking today? Where are you looking? Because God is calling us right here, right now to turn towards him so that we get our eyes off of ourselves and onto our savior. So here's what I want us to do. I want you to close your eyes. And it's gonna seem like a paradox, but I want you to close your eyes so you can see better. I want you to just, just, again, right now, Holy Spirit, we ask for you to clear our minds of any distractions. We ask for you to clear our minds of any false precepts or visions of who you actually are. And we pray that right now that your uh, clarity, God, from your word would wash over us and remind us of who you are today. Zeal Church, look at his beauty right now. All the fullness of the God of, of, the, God of the universe is pleased to dwell in Jesus, all of it. He is the perfect son who embodies obedience. If you want to know how to be obedient, look to Jesus. He is the creator and sustainer of all things. Nothing's out of his control. He's got it all and he's doing a really good job at it. He is living water for your dry and weary soul. Did you come in here today thirsty? He's living water that springs forth in abundance. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life in love for his sheep. You need a leader? Jesus is your guy. He is your shepherd who will lay his life down for you. And he'll do it in love. He leaves the 99 to go after the one. He is the bread of a life that fulfills your deepest hunger. Are you searching? Are you hungry? Are you desperate? Jesus is the bread of life that will fulfill you and satisfy you beyond your wildest dreams. He is your friend who has compassion greater than your biggest pain. You lonely? You need a friend? He's a friend like no other. He is closer than a brother. He has compassion for you. Your pain and brokenness don't confuse him. It actually compels him to move towards you in love. He is our victorious king who is worthy of all glory, honor, and praise. We will, we will never run out of things to thank him for. We will never run out of things to praise him for. He is the light of the world who has dominated the darkness of this world. Don't get it twisted. Jesus is alive and well, and he's one. 
He's winning, but he has won. We stand with him in the light. We, ain't, we don't have room for darkness today. He is the snake crusher. He is the grave robber. And he is the death killer. That is who he is. There was no one like him. He is the true vine. And when you abide in him, you will bear much fruit. Will you abide in him today and watch him spring forth fruit that you didn't even know was possible in your life. And he'll often do it through the things that you didn't even think it could happen in. He's that good. He is a warrior with an undefeated track record. I challenge you, go to the Bible, find a place where God lost. You will not find it. He wins. That's all he knows how to do. You look at the scoreboard, it's infinity to zero. He wins. He is the head of his body and he is the faithful groom to his bride, the church. He is leading us and he's loving us. He's wooing us today because he is the good groom and the good head. He is the long awaited Messiah who fulfilled every prophecy. All the things we're longing for in the book of Isaiah, Jesus fulfills to a T. Every T is crossed, every I is dotted. He fulfills them all. He is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There is no one before him and there is no one who will outlast him. He is forever. He is our peacemaker between God and one another. You could not make peace on your own. You could only make death and yet he's come to give you life. He is your peacemaker between you and the Father and the even part of this good news too is that he's the peacemaker for you and your enemies and you and those in your life. He can redeem it all and make peace in the midst of it all. He is our high priest who intercedes and mediates for us right now. What is Jesus doing? He's interceding for you today. He's our mediator. He's making uh, intercession right now in this moment for you because he is your high priest. He is our savior who crossed us over from death into life. When we needed a savior, when we needed help, and we cried out, he answered. He is your savior. I'm going to steal this from Leland. He is the way maker, the miracle worker, and the promised keeper. That is who he is. It's not a joke. It's not a cool song. It's the reality of our God. He makes ways and makes paths in the wilderness. He works miracles. And when he makes a promise, he is sure to keep it. Jesus is the word of God made flesh. Everything God wants you to know about himself is wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus. It's one of my favorites. He is the great abolitionist who has come to set us free. He has come to deliver you from bondage of sin. He's come to deliver you from the slavery of yourself. He's come to give you life and life to the full. Jesus is good, right, and holy. Jesus is full of love, grace, and mercy. Jesus is kind, gentle, and lowly. He is wise, full of knowledge and truth. He is jealous, zealous, and passionate unapologetically. He is our redeemer who is reconciling everything to himself, all of it, every last bit of it. All things are reconciled to himself. He is our savior, our sight giver, and our good news. The gospel is Jesus. He is our good news. He is the lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world, and he is the lion of the tribe of Judah who roars in victory over his enemies. He is Jesus. Will you look at him today, Zill Church?